They hate. They hate. They hate. They hate. They, they hate because they fear. They hate because they fear. Because they fear. Because they fear. And they fear because they feel that the deepest feelings of their lives are being assaulted and outraged. They do not know why. They are powerless pawns. Powerless pawns. They are powerless pawns in, in a, a blind. blind play of social forces. Richard Wright. A warning for our listeners. This episode focuses on sexual assault and gaslighting. Characters make direct references to rape. Listener discretion is advised. In the narrow drawers of the card catalog, you used to love to research by connecting words, authors, titles, and subjects. A card took you beyond to another card and another, fingers dry and splitting at the tips. In college, you learned the name for it, metadata. Meta. Day ta. Saying it made you feel powerful. Information to give you hashtag information about connected information. Classifying, mapping, uniting, informing. And what better symbol in our new interconnected world to indicate all this than two parallel intersecting lines? Simply tap hashtag and you link what follows to millions of individuals. Hashtag pizza on that photo of you eating Ryan's famous thin crust, and you joined a community of pizza enthusiasts. Hashtag beh, and your vacation memories were linked with those of millions of people who went to the beach, got drunk, and posted a photo without checking their spelling. Hashtag me too, and borders are established. Hashtag allies enlisted. Hashtag war declared. You weren't declaring war when you typed hashtag me too in the comment box of Paola's vague post. You typed it. Deleted it. Typed it again. Deleted it again. Typed it without the hashtag. Wrote, we should talk. Decided that was too intimate for Facebook. And concluded, finally, to join the community. This decision made in the drive through of a fast food chicken place on your lunch break. From Mauhaus Productions, A Blind Play of Social Forces, Episode 14, Gina Engendered. You sat at your desk trying to concentrate on payroll spreadsheets, waffle fry crumbs on your keyboard, your drawer echoing with buzzes. You couldn't force yourself to press one more time on the volume bar to silence your phone. The notifications multiplied. Every few minutes, you had to check. Jennifer had also commented on Paula's post. Sarah with an H had commented. Sarah without an H. Emily? Emma? Florence? Another Gina? Hashtag me too, they each added. You got nervous. You considered again deleting yours. It was all too much, wasn't it? Too many women. You hate it when women get together to drink and complain, all trying to one-up each other with stories of their terrible boyfriends or men from work. You joined them that one time at TGIO Chili Bees, but after being chided for not wanting to marry, fuck, kill any of the men from Mad Men, you made a vow to just go home to Ryan after work. Sitting at an interminable red light on your way home... You read about Allie's biotech professor promising to write her a recommendation if she performed some biotech on him. And you didn't want to be connected to Allie and her pervert professor, or Pam's stepdad. The light changed, and the truck behind you kept honking, and you dropped your phone before you could delete your comment. Me too? Is not the greeting you'd been expecting. You had planned to convince Ryan to please make bee beam bap and rub your feet while you ate. You'd hashtag sad face him, and he'd hashtag melt. And you'd post a photo of the stone bowls he'd bought. Hashtag best boyfriend ever. 
That's the club to be in, not the hashtag Me Too club. Oh, that? I'm deleting it. It was... I don't know what it was. You did, though. Because I was like, what? When I saw it. He was satisfied now. And you knew you shouldn't have attached yourself to what your mother called the gaggle of whiny women trapped in the past. Comment deleted. Hashtag done. You were in... Hoping you'd make me Korean food? Yes, I was. No, Gina, the Me Too thing? What was that? Why wasn't the light longer? Why was Ryan friends with your friends on Facebook? Hashtag codependent. So you told him. I was just trying to be, you know, like an ally. Like, I know what you mean, sister. You told him a lie. You were about to remind him he had called the hashtag brave just days earlier. But that wasn't the conversation you wanted to be having. A more important question, mister. Why are you creeping on Paula's profile? Hashtag deflected. You are a professional media specialist with a master's degree in library science. The people at the library call you ma'am without irony. You actually use your gym membership. You are happy not being married to Ryan and not worrying he can't make a commitment. You refuse to go on the pill or get an IUD because who said it was your job to prevent pregnancy? And you sure as hell weren't going to be defined by some trendy hashtag bullshit that just amounted to a digital pity party. You went out to eat. Ryan's reaction had not come from his own insecurity. You didn't think, but from yours. You had brought the topic of the movement up. Then you dismissed it. Not Ryan. They had come to your Twitter feed first. You had seen them race in, pushing other tweets out of the way. You had called it the Black Friday of commiseration. You had called Ryan in from the kitchen and shown him your laptop. Have you seen this? What is it? Uh, It's for women who were... But you didn't want to seem like a moron. I know what it is. You'd read all about Tarana Burke. She, however, hadn't fed the phrase to the metadata monster. I mean, like, why is it? Why now? You tell me. If only he hadn't said that. And then you had to go and say, I hate this kind of bandwagon bullshit, this I want to be part of the team crybaby crap. It's like, come on, women, you know? Ryan had gone to the kitchen, but he left the response of, I think it's brave. Hanging in the air. You couldn't have that. Brave? You had yelled after him. Reporting it to the police, maybe, but... It's whatever. What do you care? (sighs) Maybe I... He didn't need to know. I don't know. Paula's Facebook post, though, had struck you. You and Paula had been college hashtag besties. You had read that post, although she left out the details of what happened... Jesus, ten years earlier? Had it been that long? You could see the campus. Those cobblestone sidewalks. The always lit rec room in the basement of the co-ed dorm. You had to flip the breaker to turn out the lights. Reading about Paula's assault, the friend who assaulted your friend and then later joked about it, had reminded you. But you didn't want to think about it. Too hashtag painful. You hadn't told anyone back then. You didn't know there was anything to tell. You had remained friends with Steve. All of this running through your head as you waited on a chicken sandwich and fries, hold the pickle. You hadn't written every detail. Yet. You hadn't shared any secrets. Yet. You weren't even going to type hashtag me too, were you? But Paula was a friend, and hashtag me too is so easy to type and delete and type and delete and type. It had been your only way at the moment to reach across the country and touch her hand. You hadn't been thinking about your dozens of complaints about women who aired their dirty laundry in a public forum or about how Ryan might defend them. 
You were brave. You had earned the right to say, me too. This thought is what had you staring at your phone in the middle of the night, lying in bed next to a sleeping Ryan. You scoured your Facebook feed, looking for stories, looking for that hashtag. Which friends were speaking out? Who was telling her story? You liked and you sad face emojied, again and again and again, a hashtag ally, a hashtag sister. Then you got up, sat down on the couch with your laptop, and typed out your own story. Not to share, just to have. You didn't want what Paola had triggered to go away. Understandable. And it was your story, wasn't it? All yours? Come on, Gina, think. Was it your story to tell? Regardless, you wrote it all out, the details you could remember. You ended it with hashtag me too, but then deleted that. (laughs) You didn't need to tell yourself, just others. It was your right to tell others. But not yet. A thousand imagined arguments with Ryan later, you sat nervously at work, clicking back and forth between Facebook and incoming resumes, Every phantom vibration of your phone shocking you into a daydream fight. You'd said nothing to him before you left for work. No, I changed my mind. No, I needed to say it out loud. No, I may have gone overboard adding hashtag me too to every Facebook post or tweet that mentioned harassment. You'd watched him, though. Waited for him to check his phone to make a snide comment about a MAGA post from one of his conservative college friends, only to notice that his girlfriend, who had spent a good half hour deriding the hashtag MeToo movement, had become its obsessive spokesperson. And now you were nervous again. Why had Alyssa Milano even had to start this mess? No, don't do it, you would have warned. We don't need this club advertising to men, to boyfriends, to husbands, to fathers and brothers who will ask questions and... But you would have run out of characters. Scrolling down your notifications, so many hearts, so many likes. Just to a simple hashtag me too. On your post and on everyone else's post to which you added your own hashtag comment. Sitting in the pre-dawn darkness, you had not been able to type fast enough. You'd lost count at 50 hashtag me too, hashtag me too, hashtag me too, before you moved on to Twitter. You felt like an addict. Just one more, you told yourself. Then I'll sleep. That morning, Ryan asked you how you slept, and you relived that first conversation. You considered deleting your accounts and quitting the pity club because you didn't need their sympathy— That quickly you spun around. You didn't delete anything, though. And then you were at work, and the notifications rolled in, and the resumes you were supposed to call through all blurred together. You gave up any pretense of working, and instead stared through your computer screen into the faces of other women as they approved of your brave admission. Approved of your club admission. You, too. And they were hashtag proud of you for admitting it. The Facebook cycle rolled on following Twitter into cyber darkness. You were finally able to focus on resumes. You even set a goal. Narrow it down to 25 by the end of the day. Hashtag professional. You need to hire a research specialist. You told the team you were probably going to hire from within. Build a strong researcher from one of the women who had been at circulation. Ines or Sharonda could do it. 
but the resumes you were getting, so many of them were from solid librarians with years of experience in much larger facilities. You might have missed the letter completely. You wish you'd missed the letter. You had counted your 25 and were just scanning the final few resumes. There it was, right there under the signature. She'd typed it on her cover letter. You read the letter, applying for the position of, saw the posting on, experience as a librarian, bargain bin, telemarketer in college, admissions office, people person looking forward, sincerely, hashtag me too. Why would someone add that? To a cover letter? Who hashtags a cover letter? Who admits to being sexually assaulted in a cover letter? This was what you had been talking about. This is what you had complained to Ryan about. This was why you didn't out yourself on social media. (sighs) Women like this. What had this woman been hoping to say in the interview? I'm really great at handling difficult research because I was raped when I was a teenager and I worked at Bargain Bin. You put the resume at the top of the stack of interviewees, handed them to the intern who had been acting as the librarian's administrative assistant, and went home to face Ryan. When you had thought you had ovarian cancer, you'd kept it to yourself. Ryan, your parents, your friends. They only knew you'd had cramps. And you'd only said something because everyone kept asking if you were okay. Then you made the mistake of telling Ryan the doctor had found cysts. He had been a supportive boyfriend. He'd researched, asked friends, talked to his mother. He'd found homeopathic remedies online. All the while, you'd been telling him to stop. Then his mother got involved. And your mother. And you'd been surrounded by so much infuriating... Hashtag support. The biopsy had come back negative. Victory had been declared. It had been the roots, or the rest, or the tea, or prayer, or that essential oil that smelled like designer imposter's perfume. Weaving through mid-afternoon traffic, the shrill chirp of notifications illuminated memories of the cancer scare months. You had told people you had social cancer. And now your phone was announcing each electronic shoulder rub, each therapist recommendation, each support group, each church that isn't like all those other churches. The next notification would be Ryan clicking like, but really saying, I see what you're doing there. I see what you've done. And we're going to have to talk about this when you get home. You took your phone out of your purse. You could have disabled your account and you wouldn't have to talk about it. You could just hashtag be... But nothing could just be. You put yourself out there to be advised, or criticized, or laughed at, or mocked. (sighs) Everything has to be the start of an argument. And not just with Ryan, but with everyone. They were all expecting a fight. And they were ready to troll or be trolled. And they have their memes and gifts ready to spit back. And what does it matter to anyone but you? What happens to you? (laughs) You'd forgotten about it, tried to forget about it, would not think about it as often, and those women kept pushing until you couldn't just sit there. One hand on the wheel, one eye on the car in front of you, you managed to delete the Facebook app from your phone. This, you realized, accomplished nothing. When you got home from work, you waited for him. Waited for the coming discussion. You had it all worked out in your head, didn't you? What you'd say, what you would say back, you would fight over nothing, and maybe you'd have to tell him, and you didn't want to tell him. But you couldn't just not. But what if you didn't? But you needed to. Keeping the story from him would have just been worse. Worse because you would have known that he knew. And he would have to know, because otherwise, he would have built an entire narrative around what might have happened to you before he even knew you. Before he knew you existed when you were an entirely different person. (laughs) 
When Ryan did walk in the door, he greeted you like he had days earlier when none of this hashtag me too business mattered. He asked you how your day was, and he asked you about dinner. He didn't mention Facebook, and he didn't mention previous discussions. And as you ate, you watched him, hoping you could discern from the way he chewed, from the number of times he looked up from his plate, from the points he brought up about weather, about traffic, whether he knew, whether he saw it, which obviously he had. He had seen them all, all of the posts, and he was just avoiding hashtag confrontation. Huh. Ryan avoiding confrontation. You could have written a book. After dinner, you did dishes together. He rinsed. You loaded the dishwasher. He scrubbed the pots. You dried them. He kissed you and attached suds to the tip of your nose. You still had time to go into the bathroom and delete. You could have just gone into the bathroom and moved on. Except every time you turned on the television or someone sent you a text about something related, you would have been reminded that you are weak. A hashtag coward. So instead, you wiped the soap from your nose and admitted what you did. I put it back. I put Me Too back on my Facebook page, and I responded to the other people's posts and said Me Too, because, well, because Me Too, and I just, uh, you hadn't said anything, and I just didn't, I didn't want that to be there without, and and I just did it. I put it, I put it, and I don't know if I'm going to keep it or not, and I don't, I don't know, I don't want to talk about it, but I did it, and I did it. There. So... So it's there. The response you expected from Ryan didn't come. Nope. Instead, he just said, I know. Hashtag ouch. He just said, I know, in the same way he grinned and said it when you admitted you farted. The same way. So you asked him. So what? So what do you think about that? Because you didn't just want to let it be. Because you did want to have a conversation. Read argument. I guess that's what you need to do. If you want to be supportive, then there you go. Be supportive. There's a lot of women out there who have been hurt. He touched your hand, made his one dimple form, and added, I love how worried you are about this. Why do you always expect the worst from people? You just knew Ryan was going to suddenly become some masculine monster. But he was sweet and kind and supportive, and he cooked for you. And he never complained about the hair on your legs, and... It'll all be done in a week anyway, just like everything else. It would all be done in a week anyway? It's just like everything else? But you knew that it wouldn't. Not for you. Because it will never be over for you. And more and more women every day were admitting what happened to them. And he was just okay with it. He was cool with it because it would, what, be over in a week? And then people would get back to their pretending that men are pigs preying on women like garbage. But you had to wash it out of your head because he said he was fine with it. And you wanted him to be fine with it. Okay. Okay. And he hugged you. But when he hugged you, before he let go, he patted you on the back. And it was an ovarian cancer scare pat on the back. And you knew he wasn't okay. And you wouldn't be okay. And this wasn't over. You tried to sleep. A dream you could not remember woke you. Vaguely had something to do with Stephen. You hadn't said his name out loud in many years, but now you needed to. Something in the dream told you you needed to. You woke up, Ryan. I need to tell you why. Why I'm a me too. You weren't sure he heard you. I need to tell you, Ryan, why I'm a me too. I'm... Why I'm not just a supporter. These words immediately felt ridiculous. Being a part of this thing, this fad. 
But you couldn't have that same argument with yourself about whether or not you had to keep the past in the past. You thought of that car that you had bought for yourself. Let go or be dragged. The man fighting with a hot air balloon. What did letting go mean, anyway? Not thinking about it? <laughs> Getting a lobotomy? Maybe telling Ryan would be letting go. Hashtag naive, he said. Okay. And to make sure, you made him sit up in bed. You made him turn his light on. I was raped. His eyes were fully open now. And you could see he was searching for a time, a moment, something to latch on to. Something so he could know where he was when this happened. When? In college. Aren't all these things always in college? The doubts were coming back. And that voice, your mother's voice telling you we don't talk about these things. We'd been drinking. Don't all these things always involve drinking? I don't know, some party, and I was there with a friend of mine, this guy Stephen. Steve, you don't know him. You had to make sure you said you don't know him, and so you accidentally said it twice. You don't know him. Anyway, he walked me back to the dorm, our dorm. We lived in the same dorm. You know, one of those co-ed dorms? The boys were on one side, girls are on the... But it's got the same, the same rec room. And he walked me back, and I was drunk, and he was drunk, and we were drunk together. The drunken date rape college story. How original. And... We didn't make it past the rec room. I guess we were kissing. I don't remember, but I remember kissing. Maybe we were kissing. Ryan's face. Something in his face. He was angry. He wasn't angry, though, at Steve, who he didn't know. He was angry at Gina, who he did know. Gina, who gotten drunk years ago and led some frat boy on and went and got herself raped. You could see the response. You could see everyone's response, including your own, if some woman had confided in you the same event. No, it shouldn't have happened. Yes, his fault. His fault. But no. Was it his fault? After all, you put yourself in that position, alone at night with a boy. That's what we expect boys to do. Dude, you got drunk and coerced a girl into sex? Me too. You were saying all of this to yourself while you pushed the words out. We were in the rec room, and the lights were off, I guess. I guess the lights were off. They were probably off. People could see us. If they weren't off, we were kissing, and then more than kissing. I told him I didn't want to. I told him I didn't want to. I think I remember telling him I didn't want to, but I no, I didn't want to, so I must have told him I didn't, but... We didn't stop, and I guess I didn't have the strength or the wherewithal to stop him, and we had sex. Or he had sex. He had sex with me in the pool table, in the rec room, and then it was over, and I remember it being over. I remember that part. Not the sex, but the being over part. And I remember walking up to my dorm room, and maybe I was alone, and maybe he walked with me, but I was walking up to my dorm room, and I went to sleep, and the next day, I knew something. It happened. I knew it. I, I knew it. It happened. And maybe I had dreamed it, but I didn't. So that's what... That happened. That happened to me. Ryan didn't say anything. Ryan just sat there. And you had to ask him if he'd heard you. Because maybe he'd fallen asleep with his eyes open... Because you were just the same girl telling the same story of the same rape that happens all the time. So it wasn't really a rape. And maybe it didn't happen. And maybe you were asking for it. Ryan, just say something. What do you want me to say? I love you, Gina. I knew things like this happened, but I would never do something like that. It wasn't your fault. I support you. I don't know what I want you to say. So, he'd said the worst thing. Are you sure? Were you sure? Were you sure? All of this you just told him. That you'd been worried about for days. 
that you lost sleep over that happened to you and was open, wide open like a wound that wouldn't heal. Open, wide open with all these other women admitting that they too had been assaulted. Was it true? Were you sure? Did you remember? Maybe it happened differently? Yes. Yes, I'm sure, Ryan. Well, I I didn't mean... That's exactly what he meant. You got out of bed because you couldn't be in the same room with him. Where are you going? Away from you. He was very much awake then, and he said... I just meant... Well, you never... I'm sorry. What can I do? Say you love me. I love you. I love you. Yes, I love you. He said it like you'd force it out of him. I love you. I'm sorry that... happened. You're very calm. You didn't need to be angry with him now because you were getting the response you expected. And now you knew what your next step was. And you told him good night. And you went into the living room and you sat back on the couch with your laptop and you copied the story and pasted it into your Facebook page that you hadn't deactivated. And you made the post public. And you too hashtagged me too. Just because Drunk Steve didn't mean to harm you, just because he didn't have nefarious intentions, just because he's a good guy doesn't mean you weren't hurt. Ryan is a good guy. What had Ryan done innocently? How had sweet Ryan violated someone? Before clicking post, though, you added one word to your story. A last name. You got dressed quickly and left before Ryan was awake. You had got coffee and some toast at a cafe by the library. You needed to be alert because you had several interviews scheduled. You didn't want to think about Ryan or responses to your posts. You didn't care about likes. You didn't care what anyone else thought. You were just happy you'd had the courage to put it out there, right? Remember? Hashtag courage? Sitting in your office that morning, waiting for your first interviewee, you wondered if it was really courage. Copied and pasted and posted, all of which took less than 20 seconds. If you can do something that quickly without thinking, is that really courage? The courage would come, you suppose, if you were to let it stay out there. But even then, putting a truth out into the world and then walking away from it... You didn't have to face your attacker. You didn't have to face anyone because Facebook is faceless. You were into your fourth cup of coffee when Bridget arrived for her interview. Bridget, who'd hashtagged her cover letter. Bridget, who had so little experience she shouldn't have even been on the interview list. You started with the typical series of boilerplate interview questions. Bridget told you about her resume self, explained her strengths and weaknesses, talked about the best boss she'd had, bargain bin Benny, a boss whom she couldn't get along with, the old lady in admissions who was always on her about her outfits, and problem-solving with customers. You'd asked her about metadata. You asked her about Boolean searches. EBSCO. She said she was a quick learner. You hadn't called this girl in for an interview to actually interview her. And you knew if you didn't start interrogating her, you would lose the nerve. After the previous night, though, you weren't sure what the purpose was. You looked at it again, just to remind yourself how irritated you were with Miss Two Short Skirt. You asked Bridget about the accident on your cover letter. What status? Accident. I could see why you would think I said status. You smiled at Bridget, but when you realized it was your mother's smile, you pulled it in. Oh, said Bridget, seemingly hashtag embarrassed. Can you tell me about that? You could see Bridget didn't know how to respond. Normally, you would make sure a candidate felt comfortable in the interview, so she didn't feel like whatever she'd posted publicly would deny her a job. Like the woman interviewing her wasn't some obsessive nut trying to rationalize her own desperation. I'm just curious. I just wanted to know. It takes... You stopped and tried to think of the right word. Courage? 
this wasn't the precise word, but you tried it out. You worded it as a question, though. Courage? Your own embarrassment stirred something in Bridget, who responded by saying, Well, I... <laughs> That's... Private. The word private ran all over you. This was the reason you had gotten into that argument with Ryan to begin with. This was why you'd been so upset, so unwilling to put yourself out there. It's your job application. You didn't say it in private. You posted it on a job application. You moved from empathetic to offensive very quickly. You would later replay the interview and tell yourself out loud in your car, I sound like my mom. I can remove it. If, if that's an issue with this job, I, I can remove it. it. It's not a big deal. How quickly this woman, this girl, was willing to wipe it away. To say, sorry for admitting a painful truth, it's not a big deal. She could have said, I put it on my resume because I was assaulted by a man who thought it was okay because I'm a woman. You needed Bridget to say... I put that on my application because everyone who has ever been maligned by a man, who has ever been catcalled, who has ever been touched without permission, should scream, Me too! So everyone in the country can hear from all the women at the same time, Me too! And that terrifying song will stop men from taking advantage. But instead, you got, I can remove it, like some stain lifter infomercial. Remove it? You hissed. Oh, yes. You hissed. You had been staring at Bridget, jaw clenched, eyes blazing. Is there anything else you would like us to know in order to make our decision? I don't know. I don't... Um, I don't... I don't know. I guess not. I'm, I'm not sure. Are you allowed to... Okay. Well, we'll be in touch. You stood up and shook Bridget's clammy hand and asked her if she knew how to find her way back to the elevator. You interviewed three other candidates after Bridget, three qualified candidates, but sitting in the parking lot, you couldn't remember anything any of them had said. You went to check Facebook. You hadn't been distracted all day by notifications or the promises of notifications, but certainly there were notifications. At least eight hours of notifications. People must have been reposting. You had said everything. Hashtag everything. Someone was calling. Your bright, silent screen showed the number of someone not in your contacts. You answered. Is this Gina Richmond? Telemarketer. You shouldn't have answered. This is Paula Simon. Not telemarketer. The name didn't register immediately. You were still in telemarketer mode, and Paula's name had to make a couple cycles through your brain before he lit up. Paula? Hi, Gina. She said like your name was a crumb caught in her throat. Oh, my God. Paula, I... Why did you was... do that to me? What had you done? You hadn't done anything. You had... Gina? I'm sorry. You caught me off guard. I don't know what I did. The basement at Childers Hall. The pool table where I was raped. But I... <laughs> I told you everything. And you stole it all... And made it your own. But I... That wasn't true, right? Paula had her story, and you had yours. Right? They were similar, but that's what happened. So you told Paula. That's what happened. To me, Gina. That's what happened to me. No. You said, meaning, no, that's not what I meant. Yes. And do you remember what you said to me when I told you? You didn't remember Paula ever telling you. I... You told me maybe it didn't happen like that. <laughs> Jack's a good guy, you said. You're both hammered, you said. Jack had been a good guy. You all took a graduation trip together. Everyone had been there. 
Jack and Paula and Steve and... Steve. Had Paula told you she'd been raped? Told you the whole story? Every detail only to have her friend synthesize her trauma into some self-serving fantasy? But it wasn't self-serving. Not for you. You hadn't intended on telling anyone. You weren't one of those women. You... You weren't a fad victim. You hated women like... And and Paula had... Are you still there? Yes. It took me years to work up the courage to talk about what happened. And even then, I, I didn't want to share all the details. But you did. Take it down. Yes. Tina, listen to me. You were listening. You don't have to have been raped in order to be a survivor. What did she mean? You don't. You can just say me too, because men need to have some accountability. You don't have to steal someone's trauma like it's a Bjork CD. Paula was calming down. She was making jokes. (laughs) She knew you stole the CD in college be okay. You and Paula would be okay. I gave Steve your number. But don't worry. He's a good guy. Paula ended the call. And you were alone. You were more alone than you had been in weeks. Take it down? You hadn't been imagining it. You could see each moment of that night as clear as a movie screen. You could see Steve's shaggy hair that you were always telling him didn't look as cute as he thought it did. You'd stayed friends with Steve, for a while at least. Couldn't remember why. You shouldn't have. If you'd only told someone. Reported him. But he'd been a hashtag friend. Neither of you'd mentioned it, but it was there, between you. And you'd seen that his frat brothers knew. That look between them. The rec room at Childers Hall had probably been some fuck-bet rape room. You'd finally exposed it, but not only was it too late, now it was a lie. And on top of that... Paula had given your rapist your phone number. And who knew what comments had been made on your post? Had Paula been calling you a liar all day? Had Steve? Everyone was talking about you, and you had finally told the truth. You couldn't even tell the truth without everyone wanting to get a piece of you. It was 6.30. You'd been sitting in the parking lot for an hour and a half. Four missed calls. Three from Ryan. One from an unknown number. Probably Steve. Eight texts. You dropped your phone onto your passenger seat and drove home. As you drove, you worked out a plan. You would delete all of your social media accounts. You didn't need them. They were a hashtag distraction. Delete them and remove all trace of your digital self from judgmental assholes. You didn't need advice. You didn't need to know one-dimensional friends. Or animal quizzes, or quips, or memes, or gifts. You didn't need to reconnect. You didn't need the hashtag Me Too Club. It was all so asinine. It wasn't real. None of it was real. Not even the past was real. College, and Paula, and Steve, and the pool table. Distorted memories. All fake. All fantasy. Your car was real, and your hunger was real, and your tears were real, and when you got home, Ryan would be real. He wasn't real now, though. Now he existed in your head, and he, too, was angry with you. He was on Paula's side. He was on Steve's side. He was on whatever side painted you as irrational. 
Ryan was waiting on your back stoop. He jumped up and came to your car as you pulled in. Are you okay? You enacted your plan. Each account deactivated completely. No, you would not be returning. Yes, you had been dissatisfied with the service. No, you would not take a survey. You hadn't even read the string of comments on your post. You had gone straight to settings and deactivated. You had deactivated Twitter. You had even deactivated Instagram. When Ryan asked you why, you said you didn't need to see pictures of food and beach feet anymore. You would have deleted LinkedIn if you could remember your password. You had disconnected completely. You left the club. Hell, maybe you'd cancel your internet subscription. Sitting on the couch with Ryan watching some movie about time travel, you felt lighter. When Ryan had asked you if you wanted to... Talk about that thing that happened? You told him you didn't want to talk about it, and he had said... Okay. And that was okay. Ryan was real. And real Ryan was supportive. And didn't ask questions, and didn't judge most of the time. What was that your father had always said? It is best to be silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. It seemed like you couldn't watch TV without both of you staring at your phones or sharing some story from your feeds. Now you were both engaged in the movie together. You were together, not distracted by the Zucker world. You giggled to yourself, and Ryan squeezed your hand. You went to bed together and made love, and you told yourself he wasn't only thinking about your rape, and probably he wasn't, but maybe he was, and you were definitely thinking about it, and he hashtag finished, so that was something. Eight hours later, you would be sitting on this couch alone again. Coming back to bed after peeing, you picked up your phone to check the time. While it was no longer your connection to the complaining, gossiping world, the phone was your only alarm clock. You did not notice the time, though. The 12 missed calls and 18 text messages were a potent distraction. You didn't know the number, but you knew whose number. You knew why. Holding Ryan's hand and watching a man build a time machine, you'd been hoping deleting your accounts would have acted like a time machine. Deactivate them, and all the time you put into building up your status would hashtag vanish. Those moments no longer existed. Except they did. And the calls and texts from Steve prove they did. As you scrolled through his pleas to call him, his demands to call him, you cursed yourself for writing out your hashtag MeToo confession, for posting it, for adding his last name. You've been so proud of yourself for your bravery in typing his last name. Like some Nazi officer who'd been hiding in Argentina for decades, finally caught. Hashtag MeToo, Borman. Powell had insisted Steve Applewhite hadn't done what you'd swore he'd done, and here was Steve begging you to call him, certainly to plead not guilty. You'd taken it down, though, had removed yourself from that world. There was no reason to call Steve. What was he going to say? Delete the post? Apologize? Was he, like Paola, going to argue none of it happened? You could see it happening, though. You could feel each thrust. The shame. The anger. Your inability to confront him. You could confront him now, though. You'd call him back, and you wouldn't let him talk to you like Paula had. You'd hold him hashtag accountable. Steve answered on the first ring, but he didn't say anything. You also remain silent. Steve cleared his throat. <clears> you <throat> reflexively did the same. Thank you for taking it down. You still couldn't talk. Gina? Ugh, the sound of his voice saying your name made you nauseous. Please tell my wife it didn't happen. You weren't sure you heard him correctly, but you couldn't get your voice to work. Please. 
Tell her the truth, Gina. At the word truth, you found your voice. I did tell the truth. I told the truth. I told the truth. No. Yes. Yes. It doesn't matter if I was drunk and you are drunk. It doesn't matter if... If what? If what? If you picked me? Steve, you just fuck me. Fuck me, Steve. That, that doesn't matter. <clears throat> you made a guttural sound, but you couldn't make words. No. It's my turn to talk. This is my truth, Gina. His truth? As if we all have our own truths, our own facts. He kept saying your name, and you didn't want him to say your name. You didn't want a name. Disable that, too. Erase it all. You pecked me. Hand down my pants. I was a virgin, Gina. And you knew that. You, you knew that. And I told you I didn't want my first time to be drunk, and you, you said you would be gentle. No. You said that to me. No. Yes. And there was no pool table or rec room. It was the hall of your dorm room, the hall. I was walking you to your room and... Fuck me, Steve. I'll be gentle, Steve. I didn't want to disappoint you. There it was. You may have gotten the location wrong. You didn't remember what you said, but... You were drunk, and because he didn't want to disappoint you, he took you into your room and raped you. You made a triumphant... Ha! You still don't remember? Don't remember how you pissed yourself. Don't remember telling me you couldn't find your key. Don't remember me carrying you to my room and giving you my sweatpants. I was covered in your piss and I slept in the hall so I wouldn't be in the room when you changed clothes. And I didn't want to sleep in the hall but you wouldn't open the door and when I told you I left my key inside. You didn't. You couldn't remember any of that. You could clearly see Steve's ravenous eyes as he took you on the pool table. But you couldn't remember anything about sweatpants or, or keys or peeing on yourself. I swore to Patty she was the only woman I'd ever been with. For her to see that on Facebook, for her to see her husband had raped someone. His breath was raspy with mucus. His breathing became distant and he blew his nose. You thought you could hear him say... She's on the phone now. You pressed your finger into the power button on your phone until it asked if you were sure. You were sure. They were all wrong. They were lying. Gaslighting you. Did you want so desperately to be a victim? You turned Pala's story into your own? You said you hated it when everyone was treating you like you were dying when you had cysts but you secretly desired cancer. You weren't disappointed by their fawning. You were the first one to say cancer. You're the one who said it. It wasn't Ryan's Google history that was bloated with ovarian cancer support group sites. It wasn't your mother's. You could see Steve's face. Then you were looking at Ryan's face, and he was asking you if you had slept at all. You look... Terrible. <laughs> Coffee? Just the words sent waves of nausea through you. You rushed to the bathroom. Almost made it to the toilet. So close. Ryan was there for you, though. Wet rag on the back of your neck. He even called the library for you. Remember that moment. Ryan on the phone telling Barb whoever answered you were sick. Hashtag sick. You told Ryan you'd be okay. You told him you just needed to rest. You told him to just go to work. You didn't tell him about your conversation with Steve. Alone in the house, you tried to go back to sleep, but you couldn't. Paola. You wanted her to tell you exactly what happened to her. To tell her your story without her judgment. You weren't a liar. You didn't tell Steve what he said you told him. Other women had named names. There was the hashtag Balance Ton Pork campaign in France. Those women had all named names. And here, too. What else were men supposed to say? They had to deny it. 
hundreds of thousands of rape kits sitting untested. Men like Ryan, whose form of support is to pretend nothing happened. Women so offended by others' honesty that they help create the divide. You were one of those women. Hashtag that, me too. You ate some yogurt, threw on some workout clothes. You stared out at your car. You could see yourself driving. You could see the strip mall tattoo parlor tucked between a boba tea place and a head shop. You could see yourself sitting in that chair. You could feel the sting, which would be much worse than the sting on your ankle. You could see yourself looking in the mirror. The mirror. You didn't want to forget about mirrors. The tattoo artist didn't want to do it. On your lips? Hashtag yes. No face tattoos was the shop policy. He made you take a breathalyzer. Made you sign extra consent forms. You made him accept your money. It won't be perfect. This is the worst surface to tattoo on, so... He said the tattoo would fade. It'll look like you've been into a pen in a few years. You said you needed this. Not just because of Steve. Maybe your memory was faulty. Maybe it was Paula's memory. But... There was Sam and Brad and Cyrus and every guy you had to convince yourself to sleep with. Every man who'd made a comment about the way you look. Your dad and and grandfathers and all your uncles. Teachers, cops, library patrons. Instagram nipple policies, dress codes and birth control and family leave, abortion laws. Look at yourself. Pout your lips and see it. It burns. Hashtag me too. You want it always to be in front of you. To be reminded whenever you wash your hands, whenever you brush your teeth, whenever you kiss someone. You thought it meant admitting you were a victim. But now you know the truth. You can remind yourself every day of the truth. It's right there on your lips. You can't deactivate that. But you can always cover it up with lipstick. Gina Engendered stars Naomi Grossman as the narrator. Chad Morgan as Gina. Peter Evangelista as Ryan. Anastasia Wilson as Paula. Hannah Church as Bridget. Brendan Bradley as Steve. And Juan Pablo Suarez as tattoo artist. The theme music was composed by Trevor Tremaine. A full list of the music in this episode can be found in the show notes. Geneva Hicks created the podcast cover art. Additional sound effects, courtesy of Pixabay. Writer, comedian, and actor Nina Dicker helped produce this episode. Look for her memoir, Tangerine Vagina. Yes, that is the title. Where finer books are sold. Special thanks to assistant casting director Annie Weaver, who, as I continue to say each week, has been with me every step of the way. You can find out more about our cast and crew at ablindplaypodcast.com or on Instagram at Mauhouse Productions. Next week on A Blind Play of Social Forces, Episode 15, Sleepwalker X. I am running naked down the street, screaming for help. My girlfriend Joe chasing me in her car. Shouting out the window for me to... Stop! My bare feet have left a clear trail in the snow for her to follow. This is both a dream... and reality. Until next week.
If you aren't already, please follow the show. Your podcast app should have a follow button. Click it. And please rate and review. Ratings and reviews are the lifeblood of podcasts, and they take so little time. Just click those five stars. Tell us about your favorite episode. Share with friends and family. And thank you for listening.